What's up? That was really loud. I should know better. I've been using a microphone for a little while. I should know better than clapping right there. How's everybody doing? Good, man. It is so good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here this weekend. Um, well, I, I normally don't do really long series, but this one is a little bit longer because there's a lot to unpack. Uh, there's a lot in this idea of growth, spiritual growth, and um, that I really feel like God's wanting us to unpack and to, and to walk this journey out. So I don't really wanna take a ton of time to give you a recap. We've already had four weeks, so you can go back and check it out. But just kind of in, in just a quick way to kind of get you up to speed, uh, we're, we're really talking about what it means to be a fully formed disciple of Jesus Christ. What does it mean for us to grow in our faith, not the above surface, the part everybody sees, the presentable part, but the under the surface, right? Healing and wholeness and those deep places of hurt and struggles and addiction and pain, relational issues. Like, how do we get deep into those things and allow the gospel, allow Jesus Christ to heal those things. Um, and another way of saying it would be this, is that there's a, there's a gap between who I am right now and who God created me to be, right? There's a gap between that. And so this series is all about how do we close that gap to where you and I live out this true self, this self that we were created to be, where we've gotten healing and wholeness from all the stuff that's deep within us, the past, the hurts, the the things we're walking through right now maybe. There's so much healing that God wants to do that ultimately change, for us to change is inevitable. We're gonna change. But for us to grow is optional. Okay, we have to choose to grow. We have to decide that we're gonna take the right steps to grow and become who God's called us to be, who he's created us to be, our, our true selves. Uh, two weeks ago in, in part four, we looked at kind of the ingredients of growth. We talked about the parable of the fig tree and that we needed time, right? We need to give ourselves some time. We need to realize that this whole process of discipleship isn't quick, it isn't fast, it isn't microwavable, right? It's gonna take some time. Second, we learned that it's gonna take truth. It's gonna take digging underneath, looking at the root system and finding out where is the brokenness, where, where are the, the, the nutrients missing and the, the things missing. And then third was grace. Right? We're gonna need the grace from Jesus Christ, but we're also gonna need grace from each other. We're gonna need every single one of us kind of helping us grow toward who God's called us to be. So this week, what I wanna do is I wanna just press in on that a little bit more. I wanna press in on that idea of grace being bigger than just something that Jesus gives you, but something that we give one another. Because you and I, every single one of us, we need connection. This is the first point. And actually, let me say this. This may be a good weekend to take notes. If you're not normally a note taker, this may be a good one. Just open up your phone. I, I promise you, I will not assume you're on social media. <laughs> open up a note and just jot down a couple of things because I really think this is important for us to realize that we, that we need connection. And need is a really, really important word. Because if we go all the way back to Genesis and we look at the, at the creation, at the true self, right? The true idea of humanity, what we see is that Adam was connected to God. Like there was a connection, there was nothing, there was no veil, there was nothing separating Adam from God. There was a connection until Genesis three when there was a fall. And then in Genesis three there was a fall, there was sin entered the world and then there was a separation, right? And so what God did to reconnect us to him is he sent a person. He sent Jesus Christ, right? He sent Jesus Christ to come to this earth to reconnect us to him. And Jesus himself says in John 15, John 15, five, we talked about this earlier in the year, but Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Why? Because apart from him, you can do nothing. Right, that when you remain, this word is also abide, right? It's staying connected, it's staying connected to the vine, that when we do, Jesus provides things that we cannot provide on our own. That's grace. Jesus provides connection, Jesus provides growth, Jesus provides fruit that you and I cannot provide on our own. So what do we do? We get connected to the vine. We get connected to Jesus. We cannot grow in our faith without being connected to Jesus and staying connected. That word abide, he repeats it. Get this, Jesus repeats that word abide 11 times in 11 verses. 
Sounds like it's a pretty big deal, right? Right, he is just banging on the same drum over and over. Listen, you have to stay connected to me because that's been the problem this whole time is you were separated, but now I've come that you can be reconnected. So we have to be connected to Jesus, but it doesn't stop there. Our connection doesn't stop with Jesus. We also have to be connected to one another. In Genesis 1, we see this beautifully like poetic telling of the creation story. And it's absolutely beautiful the way that the way that it's written and it's just gorgeous and there's this refrain over and over and over again that when God would create, he would respond by saying it is good. It's good, it's good, it's good. And then he even slides in a it's very good. But then in Genesis 2, for the very first time, we hear out of God's mouth that something is not good in his created world. Think about that for a second. God just created everything as he wants it. It's good. Of course it's good. You created it. It's very good. Of course it's very good. You created it, right? He created everything, and then he stops in Genesis 2.18, and he says, but that's not good. In his own created world, he says this. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right from him for him. See, from the very beginning, in a perfect world, we needed companions, we needed helpers. It was not good for you and I to be alone. We need each other. Right now, in the body of Christ, we need each other to fully understand, to fully unpack the love of God, because so often the way we experience the love of God is between and through each other. And so we need each other, right? This, this idea of connection, this idea of needing each other, it's so that the love of God can flow through us, because love is ultimately relational, Right? Love expressed is very much a relational term. It's a, even 1 Corinthians 13, when you read it, and most of you know it if you've ever been to a wedding, right? We're, we're always going to read 1 Corinthians 13 because it's beautiful. It's about love, but it's about relational love, right? It, it's all connected to relationships because love expressed happens in a relationship. We need each other so that we can express God's love to each other so that we can feel and experience the depth of the very nature of God. You may get a few minutes of it here. You know, when we're singing those songs and your heart's pumping, you may feel a little bit of it right then, but day in and day out, we need each other to feel and experience the full presence of God, the full experience of his love lived out. The problem is, the problem is, is that we often We often don't realize that we have a need for connection. And that word need is so important because whenever our needs are not met, we fail to thrive. When our needs are not met, you and I will not thrive. Okay, you think about your basic needs, the basic needs of life, right? You need some water, you need air, you need food, and those things are not going to force themselves on you. They're not going to tie you down, right? The air is not going to tie you down and force itself into you, right? No, it doesn't work like that. When you have a need for air, what do you do? You respond to that need by breathing, right? No one, no, nothing forces you to eat, right? We just glory in it, <laughs> right? Right? Nobody like you feel a need and you respond by filling that need. If you don't respond to any of those three needs, what does it lead to? Death. Some of them quicker than others. Right? If you don't respond to that basic need of life, it leads to death. Isolation, loneliness leads to death. Because you and I were built and wired for connection. You look at a baby from day one. A baby has no problems telling you what they need, right? (laughs) Their language isn't developed yet, but they will sure let you know they need something, right? And then you just try to figure it out, but eventually you're gonna meet their needs. But what you don't do is you don't bring a baby home from the hospital and put it in the bed and just leave it, right? You meet its needs, right? And when you meet its needs, it thrives, 
But if we don't meet a baby's needs, what do they say? What do they call it? There's a failure to thrive, right? Malnourishment, physically, mentally, whatever, right? Emotionally, there's a failure to thrive. Well, from day one, it's not just food, water, and air that a baby needs. A baby also needs connection. A baby, a baby also needs to be picked up. When a baby cries in its crib, most of the time, you end up picking that baby up. I remember all, all three of my kids just sitting in my, in my recliner, kicked back, and just my, my, my kids just laying on my chest asleep, right? Just that connection, they need that. It's why you do baby talk, and it sounds ridiculous, but everybody does it, right? Because you wanna get in their face and you wanna connect, you pick them up, you hold them, you soothe them. Why? Because a child from the earliest place needs connection. And if a child does not get connection, they don't thrive. And what happens? It leads to detachment. And it leads to a lifetime of hurt and pain and problems because they're detached, because they did not get connection. Listen, you don't grow out of your basic needs of life. You never grow out of needing to breathe air. You never grow out of eating or needing water. You never grow out of your need for connection to humanity, to other people, to help you, support you, be with you. We need that. It is a basic need of our lives. And when we don't get that, when we are isolated, when we're lonely, when we're disconnected, it leads to detachment and ultimately death, right? It leads to a lot of the problems that we're dealing with right now. And this is not a brand new thing, but this is a, this is a problem in our world that we've been seeing for years now, even before the pandemic. I, I, I can remember seeing this article a couple of years ago. I believe it was in the year 2017 or maybe 2018. But in the UK... They saw this problem of isolation and loneliness taking root in the nation. And they actually appointed a minister of loneliness. So in UK right now, there's a minister of the interior, of foreign affair, or whatever, and a minister of loneliness. Because they were seeing that loneliness and the issues that come from loneliness were creating a like three and a half billion dollar problem. Because it leads to so many other issues when we're detached from one another. When we don't embrace that need that each and every one of us have. And then we hit the pandemic, right? And we've spent 18 months either separated or fighting, right? Divided. And so what does it do? It just separates us even more, isolates us, isolates us even more. And then on top of that, you throw a little bit of some social media and you throw false connections, Faux connections, right? There, there's, a, there's kind of this, this, I don't know, almost this deceptive thing that you think that's a connection, but it's really not the kind of connection you need. Or maybe there's unhealthy connections. There's all these other players, that, and we think maybe we're getting that need met, but we're not, and we're not thriving. We're not growing. I, I, I wanna show you the symptoms the symptoms of isolation, or another way of saying it is the symptoms of being emotionally disconnected. I want you to see if any of this looks familiar. Okay, this, is the, the, these, this list are the symptoms of isolation. In other words, when our needs are not being met relationally in connection, this happens. Depression, feelings of meaninglessness, um, addiction, panic, sadness, rage, I mean, maybe you see you up here. You know, something that you've been in for years. And if a need is not, if a core need of your life is not being met, what, what scientists and specialists say is that this is what comes, this is what happens. When a need is not being met, when you don't breathe, you physically die. When you don't have connection, when you don't have attachment and bonding to other people, this is what happens. We need each other. We need connection. And more specifically, point number two is this, is that we need connection to grow. 
In order for us to thrive, in order for us to grow, man, we need to be connected as the body of Christ in a healthy way so that we are growing one another. I've heard this same story so many times over and over again. To be real honest, I've, I've said this same story. Where someone has had pain, struggles, addiction, relational issues, depression, name the issue, just drop it in the bucket, anything, and they've dealt with it, they've circled that mountain year after year after year after year, and it's caused all kinds of problems. And eventually, they just kind of, they've had it, and they say, all right, I'm done with this thing, I'm gonna get past this, right? I'm gonna get through this issue, I'm gonna get freedom, I'm gonna get on the other side of this thing. And so they decide, they come up with a plan of action, Right, and maybe you've done this. I'm gonna, and, and normally it starts with spiritual disciplines, which are amazing, by the way. I'm not downing spiritual disciplines at all, but it normally starts there. I'm gonna read my Bible more. I'm gonna pray more. You know, I'm gonna meditate more. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to church more often. Whatever it is, right? It, it also involves maybe, um, you know, depending on if, if if this issue has hurt someone. You know, I'm gonna serve my wife better. I'm gonna take care of her needs better. I'm gonna be more present. I'm gonna be more in tune or. Maybe it's damaged work relationships. I'm maybe real intentional to repair that and fix that and serve that. And the problem with that is it sounds amazing that there's a plan. I'm gonna read books on that particular topic and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all these things. I am determined to get past this. But what inevitably happens is you fail. We talked about this a few weeks ago. You fail. You end up in a cycle where you go, ah. Oh, I beat myself up. I cannot believe that I cannot do it. I'm gonna try again and I'm gonna try harder. And we just sit in that cycle and we stay in that cycle. Because what we're doing is all output. Everything we're doing is in our own strength, our own ability to produce something that we don't have the ability to produce. So we're working really, really hard. It's like our heart, our physical heart inside of our chest. It has two, two pipes that are going out, but it also has two pipes going in. And if, if there's not blood flowing into the heart, nothing can flow out of the heart. And we get so focused on the output, on what's flowing out, that we forget that we need someone to pump in, to flow in, to speak in, to help us get there. I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this in my own life. And you may get tired of hearing me talk about my issues, but... I got a whole list of them. I got 20 years worth to talk about. So just <laughs> buckle up, buttercup, okay? <laughs> so, but listen, here's the thing. For years and years and years as a good church kid, I thought it was me plus Jesus, right? That's what I thought. I thought it's me plus Jesus, right? And it's gonna fix me. It's gonna heal me. It's gonna, I'm gonna take on the world. I'm gonna change everything, me plus Jesus. And I stayed in that cycle, of output. I stayed in that cycle of frustration. I stayed in that cycle where there were seasons where I was running away from God way more than I was running toward God because I was mad. I was frustrated. I was hurt until this realization that I have a need until I embraced that I have a need for other people to come around me and help me grow, that I cannot do it alone. And I've experienced more growth in eight, seven, eight, nine years, something like that, after that revelation than all of the years before that. And growing up in church and trying to be a good church kid is because I put people around me that don't just, aren't just my friends, they're not just my boys, they're not just my buddies. No, they are intentionally in my life to grow me spiritually, to speak into my life. My best friend, he's a church planner in Chattanooga, Shannon Greer speaks in my life on a daily basis and he is in my face. We talk about the real stuff. He is helping me grow every single week. My counselor is one of those god sin people that are, has just become a spiritual grandpa to me that just speaks in my life. Pastor Mark, whom you've met, Pastor Mark Job, who was here a couple months ago, he's become that. Like I've got a newly formed group of guys that are slowly becoming that in my small group. Like Every single week, I'm experiencing more and more of this because I embraced my need for connection. I embraced it and because of that, I'm beginning, I've grown more than I've ever experienced before but it started with me just going, okay, I have this need, I have to meet that need. I will not thrive, I will not grow until that need is met. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says it this way and I love this. He says, the Christ in their own hearts is weaker than the Christ in the word of other Christians. So often, 
The word, the Christ, the Jesus, the voice of another Christian is so much stronger than what's going on in our own heart. And we need that outside voice speaking into us, right? Speaking into our heart, encouraging us, strengthening us, but also calling out the bad, calling out the things that need to be called out. Like we need the voice of Christ from flesh and blood people on this planet that can look at us and speak to us. I don't know if you ever had this experience happen um, where your, your iPhone, and I'm just gonna assume everybody has an iPhone because you're all saved. Um, <clears throat> but I'm sorry, I love Android too. That's fine. Um, I don't know where that came from. Um, but I'm sure you've all had that experience where the, the connection you know, just kind of drops out. Whether you're going through the tunnel or you're in a random spot. I always know when Becky's phone drops out because no lie, this is what she does. She's like, I'm like, I don't know that it works like that, but it's the cutest thing. So anyway, but like when you get on an airplane, you know, and you, as soon as you get up to a certain altitude, you lose connection, right? And depending on how long that flight is, you may lose connection for quite a while, right? And the, the, the thing about that connection when it comes to our phones is the way our phones get updates, the bug fixes, all those kind of things is being connected to the network, And the moment you land or the moment you get out of the tunnel, the moment you find that spot, you know, whatever, all of a sudden there's connection and then those bugs can be repaired, right? Those things, those things, those fixes can be downloaded from the network. What I want you to see and I want us to see is that the body of Christ, the family of God is the network. The way we get the updates, the way we get the bug fixes, the way we get our system restored is through the network. It's through the the love of God in each and every one of our hearts speaking into each other, helping each other along. Why? Because we were wired for that. We were built for that from the very beginning. You see, God tried the whole program approach. He tried the the, the whole 10 rules and this will change your life kind of thing, right? He tried that and it didn't work. And Paul even said that the law is powerless to change you. Right? It reveals where you fall short. It reveals where you don't measure up, but it is powerless to get you to that place. But what gets you to that place? Love, right? The, the law didn't work, so God sent a person, a human being, flesh and blood. Why? Because God so loved the world that he sent us a person to connect with us. And then Jesus Christ, before he left, he said, now I'm gonna build a church so that you're never alone. I'm gonna build a family so that even though I'm leaving, the Holy Spirit fills every single one of us and we can come together and we can be the body of Christ so that we are connected and we can actually become who God's created us to become. It's a picture of the gospel. That's who we are called to be. For one another, connected to each other. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To love God and to love people. It's love. Love fuels our growth. It's not the law. We know that doesn't work. It's love, it's the love between each other. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Jesus, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and what? Full of love full of love for each other. I'm, I'm seeing a lot right now about the wildfires in California. Every time I go through my news app, I'm seeing more and more of it. And there was one particular story where the, I guess the park rangers or whoever, they, they were trying to save those redwood trees, those beautiful, majestic redwood trees. And so they were covering the base of them with a kind of a fire-resistant material and which they're actually pretty fire resistant as it is, but they were just taking measures and, um, because these fires are so bad. And it kind of reminded me of last year. We had taken a vacation um, up to the mountains and we went to one of the aquariums. I think it was the Gatlinburg Aquarium. Um, and, we, and on the way in, they have a massive, like a sliver of a redwood tree as a display right outside. And when I say sliver, it's 15 feet tall and about this thick, 
right? I mean, it's this massive disc with all the rings, and of course, there's the little information about what a redwood tree and all about the redwood tree, and it just, seeing this article reminded me of what I had read about a redwood tree and how amazing they are. They, they get to almost 400 feet tall. Isn't that crazy? I mean, they're massive in diameter. They're huge. They're incredible. They, they grow 10 feet every single year, every single one of them. They are the tallest living thing on the planet, and they are the oldest living thing on the planet. Pretty wild. But here's what's interesting about a redwood tree. You will never see a redwood tree growing alone. And it's because even though they are 400 feet tall, their root system only goes down about 15 feet. Isn't that crazy? 400 feet tall. You would think the roots would be 200 feet deep. But you know what they do? They go 15 feet down and they go 100 feet out. And every single redwood tree interlocks with every other redwood tree. And they're all connected. The only way that they grow to be the tallest living thing on this planet, the only way that they reach the heights that they reach is because they are connected to one another. Because they are locked together. And when one tree grows, the other tree grows. And because of that, they just continue to grow. Here's what I want you to get. I want you to understand. It's not just about get into a small group and get into community. It's about this connectedness is how we grow. Staying together, walking together, doing this sanctification, discipleship process together. This is how we grow to unprecedented heights. This is how we have a resilient faith. This is how we have the kind of life where we're healed and whole from all the wounds and then we can partner with God to go and change the world, right? It's when we take this serious and it's not just a bunch of hoopla and it's not just about coming to church. It's about actually growing in our faith and becoming who God has called us to be. This is not Christianity, discipleship, all of this. This is not a solo sport. This is a team sport. This is something that we do together and we grow together so that we can reach those kind of heights. All through the New Testament, you see this phrase, this phrase, one another. Almost a hundred times in the New Testament where the church is one another. One another, one another, one another. I heard one pastor say that the, that the primary role of the local church is one anothering one another. I like that. And you see this about a hundred different topics almost of what we're meant to do together as a church. I wanna show you just a few of them. Look at this. Love one another. Confess to one another. Value one another. Pray for one another, encourage one another, forgive one another, outdo one another in showing honor, bear with one another, spur one another on. on. I mean, there's almost 100 of these where it's just we are called inward to each other to grow each other so that we can go outward, right? Fully changed, transformed to go into the world and make a difference. But it starts with looking in. It starts with us caring and healing and helping each other. And some of you, like me, are disconnected and don't even maybe realize that this need is not being met. And when that need is not being met, those symptoms begin to arise. And you cannot survive without this need of healthy, God-honoring, intentional community that's helping me grow. So to get really, really practical as I wrap this up, I wanna give you five things to kind of teach you or, or maybe, maybe a way that we can learn to connect with each other. More so than maybe what we're doing right now. But really leaning in, here, here are the five things. The first one is this, is that we gotta admit the need. This was big for me. I had, I'm a very independent person. I'll take care of myself. I'll do my own thing. I had to admit that I need someone else. I can't do this on my own. Some of you, the, the stunt in your growth, the problem in your growth is that you've not admitted the need that you need someone else. And you're not growing. You're not going where you want to go. You're circling that tree. You're circling that mountain. You're going through the same thing over and over again because you don't have people around you helping you get to that new place. We have to admit the need. 
The second thing is this, is that we've gotta learn to move toward others. And maybe you're in a small group, what a great first step, right? To move toward someone, to just say, okay, I'm gonna try this whole thing out, right? But we have to move toward each other. We have to find ways of connecting with each other. The third thing is this, is that we've gotta challenge our distorted thinking. We've gotta challenge our distorted thinking. You know, I talked about the heart. I wonder how many of us have clogged arteries coming in. You know, that, that end pipe is just clogged up. There's some defense mechanisms. There's some fear. There's some distorted thinking that's like, <laughs> there's no way someone can love me. There's no way that I could ever trust again. Everybody's out to get me or, or how in the world would, would anyone ever accept me if I unpack all of my issues? Like all this thinking that's just blocking you from stepping into this. You gotta challenge that. And then the fourth one is this, is that you gotta take a risk and be vulnerable. Challenge all that thinking. Challenge those things that are keeping you from stepping into deep and intentional community. And just be vulnerable. Open up our heart. Allow other people to speak in and begin to help us. And then the fifth thing is this, and this is probably the biggest one, is rely on the Holy Spirit. All of this growth, all this stuff we're talking about, it's all within the Holy Spirit. It's all in him. It's why he's with us to continue to help us, to grow us, to challenge us, to go to a new place. Like we need him in all of this. We need each other. We need connection to each other in order for us to grow. You know, whenever a, a Navy SEAL is dropped into enemy territory, they say that in, in an instant, all at the same time, a Navy SEAL will ask three questions. The moment their feet, whether they came in by, by sea and they, and they come up on the beach or they drop in by, by parachute, the moment their feet hit the ground, they ask three questions. Where am I? Where's the enemy? And where's my buddy? Because they're always together. And a Navy SEAL will say that it's okay if I don't know the answer to one and I don't know the answer to two as long as I know the answer to three. I can face any enemy. I can, I can deal with any uncertainty. I can deal with it as long as I got him right there next to me. Because together, we can take out whatever we need to take out. Together, we can go through this life. Together, we can grow. Together, we can find the enemy and take him out. Together, we can do the deep search, the deep dig to find the truth, to find the hurt, to find the pain. Together, we can do that. But me alone, sitting in a dark room somewhere, processing and hurting and sitting in the, in the mess is not gonna get me there. I need a buddy. I need a friend. I need, I need connection. I need somebody that loves me probably more than I love myself, that sees potential in me, that sees what God could do in me, that will fight for me. We need that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that you could find that. And I'm praying and hoping that some of you have that. You immediately go, yep, that person, that person. It's not just a friend, it's not just an acquaintance, it's not just somebody I hang out with, but no, this person, this person is spurring me on, as Hebrews 10 says. Maybe you don't have that. You know, for me, you know, we, 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 we talk a lot about small groups and how important small groups are, and they are so important. But, but what's so important about small groups is that small groups in themselves are not the answer, okay? Small groups are the vehicle to help you get to the answer. That's all it is. So whenever, whenever you hear us talk about small groups, it's not the goal of our church to get everybody into a small group so that we can say everybody's in a small group. The goal of small groups is to see you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, right? But ultimately, the effectiveness of that relationship and that circle and that group of people, the effectiveness is not on me, it's on you. You can, you can be a part of a small group for years and years and years and never grow one bit because you didn't want to, because you didn't realize how big of a need that is in your own life. We've got to step in. We've got to, we've got to step into these kind of relationships that, that grow us, that develop us. And maybe that is a small group. I, I pray and hope that you're all in one, but if not, maybe today's the day to get into a small group. 
but it could also be through a serve team. It could be through a friend that you meet on a weekend. It doesn't matter to me. I just want you to have community. I want you to have this kind of community because it's not just you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus in intentional community that equals growth. You need each other. We need each other. We were wired to need each other. Let's pray. God, we just thank you that you are here, that you are with us. And God, I just thank you for the word, your word. I thank you, God, that you built us to need one another, that we were not put here to do this all on our own. And I pray that today we will realize that we need each other. That it's more than just a friendship, it's more than just an acquaintance, God, that there is a deep spiritual meaning to community. Biblical, spiritual community is so deep. And I pray that we embrace it today, God, so that we can continue to grow and become who you've called us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching and being a part of City Hope. And listen, uh, if you feel like you need to take a step. Maybe it's a decision to follow Jesus or, or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life. Or maybe it's even just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to do that. So right now, there's a QR code coming up on our screen. Follow the link and give us the opportunity to connect with you. Because if we know anything, it's that content alone is never gonna help you uh, find the life change that God has for you. So look, give us the opportunity to connect with you. We'd love to get to know you and help you grow and be a part of our church. But we love you, can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope.